weekend for you. This is awesome. I'm very excited that you're all here today. Um, we are in, uh, we're just basically, this is a, a one, um, one and done standalone uh, sermon before we get into the Colossians series next week. Um, but this, this is a series that actually um, has a lot to do with um, this weekend. Um, and I'll tell you about that in just a second. But the first thing I have to say is this. Um, one of the things that um, my, just a couple of days last week, a couple of days prior to this, uh, my son Cohen came up to me. Cohen's my, my fifth grader. And he came home and he said, Dad, um, my teacher said something and I don't know if I agree with it or understand what he said. So if you're a parent, like educators in here, teachers are like, oh great, here it comes. But if you're like just a parent, a non-educator, you're like, and your kid says, my teacher said something I'm not sure if I agree with or understand. You're like, what did he say? Thinking like, you know, they, you know, rip, you know, took out this massive handbook of, you know, terrible things that they're going to educate your kid with. And that's what they did. And, and Cohen said, well, they said that 9-11 was one of, the fir- one of the worst moments in American history, one of the worst days in American history. But 9-12 and the days and weeks afterward were some of the best moments in American history. And I don't understand how that works. And I was like, oh, (laughs) of course you don't understand because you weren't there. Like, I mean, if you're most of a lot of you weren't born yet in this room. But for those of us that are old and we were there, we get the vibe of what like it feels like to go 9-11 had so much anger and confusion and frustration and chaos and fear. Like we're, you know, it was a day that, that was just bananas. Everything inside of you is just being ripped apart. And you just can't believe your eyes. It's like, is this a dream? Am I going to wake from And that's if you had no one that was even in New York City at the time. Even if you're in proximity of Chicago, you're like freaking out. Like, does this mean that we're next? All these weird thoughts. That was 9-11. And then 9 Nine twelve happened. And on 9-12, all of a sudden, you found yourself doing things that you didn't previously do. People found themselves making phone calls to people that they hadn't made phone calls to in a long time because of family rifts or drama, baggage that they had. They found themselves reaching out to community members and neighbors that they didn't even know the name of. It was a weird day, 9-12. 9-12 was a day when all of a sudden people had a chance to, to like, they, they were like, coming together in ways that they hadn't before. That weekend, churches all across our country were packed. And that lasted for three weeks. (laughs) And then we remembered, because as Americans, we never forget. We remembered that we're divided. Republicans remember that they're Republicans. Democrats remember that they're Democrats. People who had beef with their aunt remembered, oh yeah, that's why I've got beef with my aunt. People that, that had uh, reasons to stay inside and not talk to their neighbors because life is way more easier when you don't have people that, that are adding drama to your plate, went back in and closed the doors. And, and that's what happened three weeks after 9-11. And that's, that's because tragedy can, can unite a people. A common enemy can unite a people. But if, if, we're, if we're revolving around that to keep us united and keep us purpose-driven moving forward, it only lasts as long as that pain or that fear is still in our bloodstream. As soon as that dissipates, if that's what's uniting us, we run right back to our norm, which is divided, which is what Paul was talking about. Paul is talking about in this passage something that's super, super important. Um, if you've got your Bibles, go ahead and open up to the book of Philippians chapter 2. Philippians is a book that Paul wrote um, to a church that needed encouragement. And actually, if you could stand as, as you're turning to Philippians chapter 2, Paul wrote it to a group of people that uh, they were Christians, but they realized that even though they're Christians, they sometimes want to give up. There's moments in life that are just so dramatic and so just, you know, issue riddled that, that you just want to give up. You want to give up your faith. Like, I don't know if I, can, I believe this anymore. You want to give up maybe your family? I can't handle these people anymore. Sometimes you want to give up your life. And, and for within the, the, that's not something that's a 21st century thing. That's been a reality as long as human beings have been struggling with the brokenness inside of us. And so Paul's writing this letter to a group of people to encourage them. Like that's the whole book of Philippians is, I want to encourage you. And in this passage, he says, here's the center of what we have to be encouraged by. He says this in chapter two, verses one and following. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, 
If there's any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing, nothing, by taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right, please be seated. One of the things that that we see in this passage, jumping right off the page, is this need to be united, but to be around something, united around something far more resilient than even the best things that we can unite ourselves around. More resilient than than patriotism, more resilient than even love, more than love of country, more than love of family, more than love of of self. Paul is arguing for something that actually can keep people united far more stronger than any one of those things. Um, If you're a volunteer at this church, we think that we've got the best volunteers in all of Grundy County. We had a serve team kickoff event where we wanted to just like honor all of our volunteers and like just... uh, cast a vision for this is what's going to happen this year. We're going to like pray for all of you guys. We're we're stoked about that. And then in April, we're going to celebrate everything that God did. And the theme of this event was, it's not about me. Because we recognize that this is counterintuitive to what most of us live out. Most of us live, it's all about me, or it's mostly about me. But we realize that that, that when we live this way, we are the most miserable people on planet earth. Think about the people that are the most into themselves. And the more into ourselves that we get, the less and less human we become. The less and less us we really are, and certainly the less and less person that God's crafted us to be. And if you look at what Paul's saying, it's exactly what he's pointing out. He takes this whole first section right here, and he says, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, any comfort from his love, any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, basically he's like, look, if you— love Jesus at all. If you're connected to Jesus, even even, like this small, like I'm not talking about varsity level Christian. If you've been a Christian for five minutes, if there's anything about the fact that Jesus gave his life for you, then that should do something inside of you. It actually promotes something. This, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one in one in spirit and one of mine. So basically, if you're a Christ follower, if you're a Christian, then be united. Let that be something that, that constantly pushes you to think about, other, not just thinking about yourself and your own interests and your own needs, but other people. Um, and if you take a look, he talks about how to do that. He says this, instead of being motivated by selfish ambition or vanity, each of you should, in humility, be moved to treat one another as more important than yourself, which is super easy to do. Said nobody. Nobody thinks that way. Be moved to treat one another as more important than yourself. Not looking, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. You're thinking about other people. And and this is like, if you're a Christian, Paul's saying, that's like foundational who you are. Because you realize that what you have is not something that you've earned. It's not like you're so like amazingly, like super moral person that Jesus is like, okay, I'll save you. You did enough. Nope, not at all. In fact, it's a free gift. Here's the thing. How many of you love pizza or, or moderately like pizza to love pizza? How many of you don't love pizza? <laughs> it's okay. Jesus still loves all of you people who don't love pizza. <laughs> and what's the best pizza? Awesome. That's right, Giordano's. Okay, so here's the thing. Some of you are like, oh, Rosati. Some of you, sure, you're wrong. Now, and some of, you are, some of you are like, but I'm lactose intolerant. We're not talking about you. Everyone else, let's say that you're at your house and you're a cheese-loving, pizza-loving person and all of a sudden a van from your favorite pizza place comes in front of the house. You're standing in your driveway, your family's there, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden the door opens and they bring out a pizza and they say, hey, we want to just honor you and thank you for being you. Boom, we just think you're awesome. Here's, here's a pizza. Enjoy it with your family. And all of a sudden you're like, what, did I win something? Like, what did I do? Like, no, 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 this is for you. And you're like, sweet. And your neighbors all see it too. And you're like, 
That's right. And all of a sudden, another van pulls up. They open up the van. They say, hey, actually, we got 15 more pizzas for your family. And all of a sudden, you're going, this is going to be an amazing night. A terrible morning, but amazing night. And all of a sudden, another van shows up. And another. And another. All of them filled with pizzas. And all of a sudden, you're standing there going, there's no possible way. Well, maybe there is a possible way. I could freeze all of these. I could live off of these for like 15 years. This is going to be it. And like you're, you're processing all of this. And all of a sudden you look out and you see on your block, all of your neighbors going. <laughs> and you're like, kids, get the pizza box. Come on, get the pizza. And you go inside and you shut the door. Because, I mean, this isn't their pizza. I mean, yeah, is that a jerk move? Yes. Is that jerky? Yes, absolutely. But, I mean, at the same time, I mean, if you offered them to have this pizza, what if they said, but I'm lactose intolerant? Then you've offended them. And that would be awkward. So, I mean, it's better to keep the pizza in the house, your house, than offer it to them, right? No. There's something about recognizing I didn't do anything to deserve this and this is more than I could possibly use all for myself that promotes and prompts a person to start thinking about who needs this more than me? Who can I share this with? And that, from Paul's angle, is a Christian. A Christian is not someone who's like, I just feel like really sketchy about sharing this with other people because like, what if they're spiritually lactose intolerant? I don't want to be offensive. I mean, for crying out loud. I mean, to each his own, right? If they're interested, they can go down to Giordano's themselves. Or are we the type of people that say, I've been given so much, I don't deserve it, I didn't earn it, and other people need it. And so that prompts me to be other-centric, not looking to my own interests, but to the interests of others. And, and the crazy thing is, is that, that if we wanted a bottom-line way to say that, that's, it's saying that the real me, the real me is not living for me. And again, this is something that we communicated to our serve teams. We we told them this is what we want us to all be about, to recognize that the truest you is not the you that gets everything that you want, gets all the cool toys, the cool... When I was in junior high and high school, when people asked, what do you want to be? If you're a junior high and high school, people ask you, what do you want to be when you grow up or what do you want to do when you grow up? Honestly, behind all of our answers, at least the people in my generation, it was uh, something that pays me enough money that I can do everything I want to do. I want to go to the places I want to go. I want to have the sweet ride. I want to have the cool house. I want to have the bubble, you know, whatever, all the things. And the thing is, is that everyone in my class that actually got there, and there were people in my class that actually got, there's you, some of you, you got there. All your dreams, you're there. Your parents are like, oh, all of our dreams are come true. You've far, you know, gone far beyond us. But we all realize that when we get to the end of that, whatever we thought this meant, The truest me, the happiest me, the most promoted me, the most accoladed me, the highest paid me, the coolest house me, the best vacations me, the relationship me, the one with kids me, whatever. We get to that and realize that that didn't do it. That didn't make us the truest us that that doesn't leave us with any wanting or longing or, or feeling disconnected from reality. The truth is, is that sometimes it even adds to that. The people with the most oftentimes feel like they have the least. I love, one of the things I love watching, and I've talked about this before, but we, when we do Spy Kids, the day camp here, you've got like 600 kids on this campus, and you have like 300 volunteers. It's just bananas. And, and the cool thing about it is that a lot of these are junior hires and high schoolers that have given up their full week to dedicate themselves to serving little elementary school kids. And if you're an elementary school kid, no offense, but there's a reason your parents send you to Spy Kids. <laughs> And these high schoolers are just like the whole day long serving your kid. The kid that you were stoked to get out of the car as fast as you could. And they get to the end of a week full of them. And they say, I wish I could do that again. I wish that every day could be like those days. Why? Because they realized that life at least the fullest life is not about what I can add to me, to do for me, bring pleasure to me. The greatest joy is finding ourselves connected to the purpose of serving others, pouring ourselves out for others. And that's going to cost you. You will lose if you live this out. 
You will. But you will not be the first, and you will not be alone. And Paul points it out. He says this. He says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. All of a sudden, this is not just about being united. It's about living a certain way in a certain lifestyle where you're, you're actually modeling after Jesus. Well, what did Jesus do? Who, being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. He had the privilege. He had the right. He had the ability to do whatever he wanted to do, and he surrendered it. He flushed his rights. He flushed his privilege. He flushed his status. Even though he had it, he chose to surrender it so that this— Rather, he made himself what? Now, does Jesus deserve everything or nothing? Everything. Status, honor, glory, everything. And yet, he makes himself what? Nothing. Why in the world would anyone do that? And on top of it all off, taking the very nature of a servant, the very one in the whole universe who deserves to be served, chose to flip the script on that and chose instead to be someone that serves others. And then Paul says, that's how we should be. We should live the type of life where we're constantly conditioning the, the notion that it's not about me. It's not about me. It's, it's something that I can actually, uh, one sec. There you go. It's not about me. And that it's not about me. That notion, that idea, that's the me that God intended for me to be. So here's, I just want to break it down really quick. Um, if you've got on, on your seats or you may have been handed one of these when you came in, if you could just take this out and look at it. Some of you are the type of people that carry pens. All four of you <laughs> d- do that. <laughs> it's probably the same amount of people that carry purses. So, if you've got a pen, awesome. There's a pen like in your, in your row somewhere there like with the, at the friendship books. If you don't have a pen, take mental notes. This was uh, actually written in negative five fonts so that if you read it, you're probably 12 years old, which is great. But this has got a list of opportunities where we can actually flesh this out this fall. Because if you're here, you're probably here because of the fact that you are somebody that believes this stuff. You, or you, wanna, you want to believe this stuff if you don't believe it yet. And you want to grow in it if you do believe it. But sometimes we feel like we're just in the same rut of I show up, I walk out, I show up, and I walk out. I don't feel like I'm getting that much closer to Jesus, at least in my life. And what if this year, what if this fall was one of those breakthrough years for you? And I I love this. I love watching this in people's lives where all of a sudden they like break through in this massive growth step in their spiritual walk when they least expected it. What if fall of 2021 was that for you? Wherever you're at, you take the next step. And, for, and we've got like a ton of next steps on here. And what I want to encourage you to do is this. If you got a pen, I want you to go ahead and check as many as applies to you. And then if you're someone who just like, I want to remember this, take it home, put it in your truck, put it in your mirror and be reminded this fall, I want to take the next step in one of these areas. Or if you're someone who's like me, you're super flaky, where you're like, ooh, I'm going to totally do that. Then you walk like five minutes later, you forget it. And you want some accountability, go ahead and fill this out, put your name and your phone number on there, fold it up, and then drop it in the basket on your way out. And then what we'll do is we'll, we'll follow up with you. Hey, you said that you wanted to help out on a serve team. We can help plug you in. Hey, you said that you, you wanted to, to be baptized. Awesome. We, we're going to help plug you in. In fact, in just a moment, there's a couple of people that are going to be um, exiting out of the room because they're going to be getting ready to get baptized. This weekend, we have 18 people that are are proclaiming what Jesus did in their lives in baptism, which is just awesome, yeah? It's so cool. Now, I don't know all of their stories, like if they stood right here and they told you all their stories, why they took that step now, but each of them came to a point of making that decision to take the next step. What step are you going to take? Let me just give you a couple of ideas of some opportunities. Um, Again, it's easy to show up here and walk out anonymous, it's for some of us, when you're first coming to a church, that's gold. Like, I love not knowing anyone. I love coming in, stealing their coffee, and leaving. And boom, it's great. If I've got kids, it's even better. I can just ditch my kids. It's like an hour of peace. That's awesome. But if you're sensing, I want to grow beyond that. I want to get deeper than that. Well, then what I want to encourage you to do is to actually take this seriously and jump into one of these. We got real life groups, and they're all age groups, right? We, got, we believe in real life groups from like, like little kids all the way up to old folks because all of us need human interaction. All of us need the opportunity to interact with, with people where it's beyond just listening or singing, but where you can actually sit in someone's living room and ask a question. I don't know if I agree with what you just said. 
Or where do you get that out of that verse? Or this week I'm really struggling. And all of a sudden we get a chance to actually be a part of praying with one another. We've got real life groups. We've got a table right out in the atrium where you can sign up to jump in on one. And the cool thing is that we're going to keep on adding more and more host homes throughout this fall. But I want to challenge you to jump in. Get into it. Next week we're going to start a series in the book of Colossians. Um, here in the main room, and we're going to, the small groups are going to be following up with that throughout that whole series. It's like an eight-week series, and so if you're like, I'll give this a try for eight weeks. We'll see how that goes. Do it. Just do it, and honestly, if you go three weeks, and you think it's super lame, and you never show up again, no one's going to kill you over it, for real. They haven't yet, so do that. Sign up for that. Now, that might be the next step for you. Some of you might be like, I've been attending this church for a while, But I want to know more about what this church is all about. And some of you might want to be a member of this church and figure out what that all means. What we have as far as um, taking the next step at our church in that regard is this, this thing we just developed. We used to do like a membership class, but we decided to revamp the whole thing and call it Discover Mission, where we're actually going through what does it mean to be real with God, real with each other, and real in the world, the heartbeat of our church. And so in October, on the 10th, 17th, and 24th, we're going to have classes at 9 a.m. So you could like go to that class and then come to second service like you are right now. We'll watch your kids for both services. It's cool. But get, you'll get a chance to actually know what we're all about. So you could sign up for this on the church app, church center app, or on, on our, our website and just get into that because this is going to be super, super cool for you to experience what is it that we're all about. Now, one of the things that we're about is not only just being real with God, real with each other, but real in the world. And that means that we look at our community and say, we believe in missions, but we also believe in being a good witness of Jesus right here in our community. And in our community, we have military. And so one of the things that we want to do on November 13th is honor our military and actually bless um, some Marine guys who are over in Joliet. We're going to be grilling out for them and everything else. So if you're someone that's like, I've been looking for an opportunity to step in. This is actually one of the things on here, serving on an Endeavor event this fall. Check that off. Where you're actually saying, I'm not just going to be a consumer of spiritual good. I want to be someone who's blessing other people. God didn't just bless me so I can hoard it. He blessed me so I can bless others. And so on November 13th, we're going to have a crew of people. I hope it's an army of people that's able to bless these guys. When they heard that we were actually willing to do this, they were like, no church has ever done this. Now again, what Paul says is we run to need and we meet it. We run to very, very, the same, very much the same thing that we honor our first responders to, of doing. They run into calamity, into chaos. When other people are running out, they go in to save lives when everyone else is running out to save their own life, right? That's noble. But according to Paul, that should be natural for Christians. The natural thing is that we, we, we try to be the people that are blessing not because we're awesome, but just because that's what he's done in our life. And so I, we're, we're going to start having signups for this next week. If you want to be a part of this, it's going to be sweet. And that's part of our endeavor. Again, endeavor is our local missions opportunities where we could be a blessing in this community. But we don't just have military in our community. We have jails. We have prisons. And one of the things about prisons is that at Christmas time especially, it gets incredibly difficult for the families of those who are incarcerated. Because they, they feel like dad has forgotten them or mom has forgotten them. And what we want to do is we want to come alongside and help facilitate mom or dad who are in prison with the ability to give a gift to their kid. Or it's something from their parent that, that will be for them. And so we've got this um, um, gift card drive that takes place on the 20th and 27th. Whenever we've done this, like we, we offer it and like Saturday service blows everyone out. And they like buy all the cards and then Sunday services are like, what? what's going on, man? And so we're going to make sure that we have enough needs for, to go around and, and we're going to be prepared for that because we want everyone who wants to to be a part of this, to recognize, again, I could spend this money on me, but it's not about me. And I want to take the next step of conditioning that reality. We believe in local missions, but we also believe in global missions. And one of the things that our church that we have as a rhythm every January is going to Haiti. Now, our church does not believe in drive-by missions. Drive-by missions are where, like, we, you know, go into a country. We don't really know people there, but we do a couple things. We feel good about ourselves and bounce and head home. That's drive-by missions. We don't believe in that at this church. We believe in having a long-term relationship with the local church where God is working, and we want to come alongside our brothers and sisters in Christ that are nationals in that country and just encourage them to continue doing what God was doing before we got there and what God will continue doing after we leave. And so we go to Haiti— every year to, and this has been a long-standing relationship we have with the local church in Haiti. My wife, Julie, give it up for Julie. (laughs) Who is awesome. Last night, instead of saying my wife, I said my Julie. This is my Julie. Um, 
she's the head, she's the, the Haiti director for DSMI, so she leads this team. You're in great hands with Julie. And so I want to encourage you, if you're like, what's the next step of doing something that's not just, I'm going on a sweet vacation to Cancun. I'm doing something where it's just all about me and my pleasure, but I can actually step into something where I'm doing something for someone else this year. I would say this is an amazing next step for you. All, everyone who's been on one of these trips knows it. And this has actually kick-started a lot. Of, some of our greatest volunteers in this church, it's kick-started their service at this church where they were kind of doing nothing. They were flatlining as far as serving others to serving people consistently and faithfully. And so the, the, there's going to be, there is a sign-up on our website to uh, f- register for that event. Or you can just talk to Julie afterwards as well. But that's January 2nd through the 9th. And... Last but not least, again, there's more opportunities on here. I hope you've been checking or thinking about it. Um, our, the last opportunity that I want to just mention is actually what we're celebrating today, but it's the next time. Every time we do a baptism, every single time we do a baptism, the next time we have baptisms, people are getting baptized because they were, God used the story of someone previous to them that they had a chance to hear to motivate them to go, all right, I'm all in. I'm going to do this. Baptism doesn't save you. Um, Jesus was very clear that, that, that people learn about him, put their trust in him, and then baptism is, is a way to publicly proclaim, I am connected to Jesus. There is nothing spiritual or mystical in the water. It's Manuka tap water. There's things in Manuka tap water, but none of it is spiritual or magic. Okay? All this is is a public declaration of the fact that I am connecting to Jesus in his death and in his life. That's something that's already happened in my life, and I want to go public with that. I want to, I want to let that to be the, the training wheels of boldness in my life. And so this weekend, we get a chance to see 18, but I, I want to encourage you, if you're, if you're a Christian, if you're a follower of Jesus, or if you're someone that, like, look, I'm still on the fence. I'm still kind of like a soft agnostic at this point. This fall, you might take the next step and turn your life over to Jesus, putting your trust in him, recognizing that, that it's only through his sacrifice on the cross that you have the opportunity to have a reconnection with God, the very thing your soul longs for. That might happen for you this fall. And if it does, I want to encourage you to sign up for this. Because the only prerequisite to baptism is that at some point, whether it was two years ago or two minutes ago, you put your trust in Jesus. He's your Savior, and you want other people to know about it.